thankful to Bombay Spine Society for inviting me to this conference. And my topic is Atlantoaxial Rotary Subluxation and its Evaluation and Management. What I shall try to cover in the next 10 minutes. Definition, predisposing factors and etiology of Atlantoaxial Rotary Subluxation. Go on into the kinematics of C1-C2 rotation. The imaging protocols which have been so well described recently and the types of atlantoaxial rotary fixation and the finally the treatment algorithm. It is defined as conditions inclusive of all gross departures from the normal rotational relationship between C1 and C2 and it is characterized by a persistent and often painful rotational deformity with the head in the cock robin position as if the chin is turned to one side and the neck is laterally flexed to the opposite side, reminiscent of a robin listening for worms. The commonest etiology is of course trauma and secondly it is infection which might be an esophageal infection or a proximal lymphadenitis in the neck region which is Grusel syndrome and tubercular infection. Previous surgery, especially of the head and neck region, can lead to soft tissue contractures and ultimately atlantoaxial subluxation and a con assortment of disorders ranging from rheumatoid arthritis to Down syndrome, Marquio syndrome, and some congenital cervical anomalies, including a failure of the proatlas, leading to absence of the lateral mass of the atlas, has been importantly associated with this condition. Now let us look at the kinematics of C1-C2 rotation. There are three distinct phases. The first 23 degrees C1 moves alone. The next 23 to 65 degrees C1 and C2 both move. C1 moves more than C2 and beyond 65 degrees C1 and C2 move together. Now obviously if you plot the C1-C2 angle graph, the initial first 23 degrees the gradient is 1. That means the C1 alone is moving and the C1 C2 angle increases according to the increase of movement of C1 from the neutral axis. For the next 23 to 65 degrees there is a double motion phase that means the angle between C1 and C2 gradient gradually decreases from 1 to 0 and in the next few degrees that is beyond 65 degrees the two bones move in unison and that means that they can rotate up to 90 degrees and this implies that the head turns beyond 65 degrees rotation exclusively occurs at the lower part of the spine the kinematics of c1c2 rotation was put forward by tackling pang and this the curve which he put forwards as I had explained in the last slide if you look at the C1 C2 angulation plotted on the Y axis and the C1 movement from the neutral axis on the X axis in the initial first 23 degrees you have a linear relationship that means the C1 moves the, as much as the C1 C2 angle increases and in the next few degrees that means 42 degrees you have a gradual diminution from 1 to 0 of the gradient of this curve because in this part the C1 and C2 moves together and the C1 C2 angulation gradually comes down that the increase of C1 C2 angulation with the increase of C1 angulation gradually comes down and after that beyond 65 degrees they move in unison and in this entire part Ultimately, that means beyond 65 degrees, the C1 and C2 are locked at an angle of 43 degrees with each other. The imaging protocols also has been put forward by tackling Pang, and there are three sets of CT scans which have been described. The first is in the P position, that is the presenting position with the head undisturbed and in a subluxed position. The next is with the head turned to or close to the zero position by 
the physician who is attending the CT scan and that is a P0 position. And finally, the head is cranked to the opposite side as much as tolerable within the tolerable limits of pain and this could be the P underscore or the corrected position. Now, if you look at the angulation of C1 to C2, that is the C1, C2 angulation, this is basically the angle of C1 from the vertical and an angle of C2, again from the vertical. So, C1 minus C2 is the angle to look forward for. Obviously, as they move, the angle is C1 minus C2. So, based on the severity of the pathological stickiness between C1 and C2, Group 1 represents the extreme form with the two bones locked in coupled configuration. Group 2 is less severe stickiness in that presenting separation of the angle was reducible but C1 could not be made to cross C2. And finally, if there is a minimal stickiness, C1 should be forced to cross C2 but only if the head was cranked to the expected null point at 0 degrees. Of course, this does not include irreducible atlantoaxial rotary fixation, that means the Fildy Hawkins types 3 and So, if you look at the three examples here and the initial position of the P position, that means at the subluxed position which the patient initially came to you with, this is the CT scan, that means C1 is rotated over C2. C1 angle is 40 degrees, C2 is minus 5 degrees, which means that the C1, C2 angle is plus 45. Now, in this, if they are very mild, that means the C1 could be rotated to the opposite side with the C1, C2 angulation ultimately at minus 25 degrees on the P underscore position. This means this is highly flexible. Whereas here, you can see that it is very immobile and C1, C2 angulation to start with was 45, it became just 40 degrees, that means just 5 degrees would be corrected and in the middle part, that means type 2, which is not too sticky, again not too uh, mobile, it is usually C1, C2 is plus 40. So, in type 1, which is maximum sticky, maximum stiff, this C1 could not be rotated beyond C2, whereas in the minimalist, if you can see that C1 rotates over C2 if the head is cranked to the opposite position. These are three clinical examples taken from the same paper in which the proximal row is the C1 cut, the distal row is the C2 cut, the middle column is P0, and the left column is P underscore and the right column is P. That means the position at which it came in a sublux position. So you see this is type 3 where C1, C2 angulation becomes negative. That means this is the most flexible. And as you can see C1 started off with this side. That's C1 with the uh, angulation like this from the vertical. And here at P minus position, P underscore position, the C1 could be made to rotate completely over C2. C2 is here and C1 has gone beyond C2. So that means C1, C2 becomes negative. Whereas type 1, which is the most sticky, C1, C2 gets fixed at something very close to minus 40 degrees. So this is the subluxed position where she came with P. And this is the oppositely cranked head. When you can see C1 does not even come to the neutral but C2 go rotates like this, but C1 remains locked in about minus 40 degrees. And in between is type 2, in which the patient started with like this, in which the C1 is rotated over this C2. And in the oppositely cranked position, you can see that it has just come in line with C1, C2 and decreases. This means this, this has just become something like 5 or 10 degrees, but still has not become negative. Once it becomes negative, it is very highly flexible. Just now, the original classification of types of atlantoaxial rotary fixation was given way back in 1977 by Fielding and Hawkins, and which we know in type 1, capsular ligament disruption occurs, and there is a peg view asymmetry with the atlantodense interval less than 3 millimeters, and the odontoid is the pivot. That means 
the C1 rotates over the odontoid. Whereas here the atlantotail interval is not disrupted and there is a capsular disruption to C1 joint. In type 2, there is a transverse ligament tear along with the capsular disruption, and here one particular facet joint of C1, C2 is the pivot or the axis over which C1 rotates. And here the ADI becomes something between 3 to 5 millimeter if they are treated early. This unilateral subluxation can be reduced. And in type 3 and type 4, there is transverse ligament as well as secondary ligament tear. In type 4, there is also an odontoid disruption. So in type 3, both the lateral mass moves forwards with the ADI obviously more than 5 millimeters. And in type 4, both move backwards. Both the joints of C1 move backwards to C2 and this can only be possible with a odontoid fracture. Now let us look at the treatment algorithms. All acute and subacute atlantoaxial rotary fixation patients should be treated with halter traction and on reduction the child should be braced for three months. This is the typical patient presentation in an acute and subacute phase and they are usually well treated and the patients remain asymptomatic. Now in chronic or delayed presentations, they are usually managed with skull traction followed by halo vest immobilization for three months. And all recurrences while in or after removal of halo fixation, as well as all irreducible deformities after two and a half weeks of skull traction treated by surgical fusion of the C1-C2 joint. If you look at this particular patient, she was an acute subluxation and it was this was the initial CT scan and initial traction followed by bracing for three months cured her completely. Now, let us look at a chronic or delayed presentation. This is a patient again who had a delayed presentation and this was the rotation of C1 on C2 and this is her with a halo after traction and this halo was continued for three months. All recurrences while in or after removal of halo fixation, all irreducible deformities, even after two and a half weeks of skull traction. For example, this patient presented with a fixed irreducible atlantoaxial rotary fixation, and this was her initial traction where she didn't reduce, and that was why we did a complete open reduction of the joint, followed by C1, C2, my girl's screw fixation. This was the final result with a deformity completely corrected. Thanks for your attention.